this conversation uh, today. Our carbon talks will warm people up and give people some inspiration, and we have a speaker who's extremely good at doing that. So, welcome to Carbon Talks. Uh, for those of you who have not come before, this is a, uh, um, a lunchtime presentation and speaker series that we run um, here at SFU, uh, dealing with all matters touching on climate change. Um, the format is as a presentation and a dialogue. We keep it strictly to an hour. Um, so, our speaker, in this case, uh, uh, Jose Echeverri, will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and then we turn the floor over to all of you, uh, both to comment and ask questions. These are being webcast, so we definitely have uh, people who attend online, and we encourage them to send questions and comments uh, uh, to at Carbon Talks or uh, using the conversations in the hashtag Carbon Talks. We'll take uh, questions and comments on Twitter that way from those people who are watching us from beyond Vancouver. Um, I'd like to always begin by thanking our funders who make this speaker series possible, the North Growth Foundation, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, which covers the costs of webcasting of these events, and of course the SFE Center of Dialogue. I neglect to be by introducing myself. I'm Michael Small, and I'm the Executive Director of Carbon Talks and Renewable Cities here at the SFE Center for Dialogue. Just two other things. Uh, we'll be circulating a sign-up uh, list for uh, two newsletters, which we'd like to make sure that uh, you're included if you're not already on those letters. One is for our own Carbon Talks list, for those of you who uh, have not uh, on, come to these events before and on our news list. And the other one is for Pick's Weekly Climate Examiner, which is an excellent news digest. Uh, today's uh, <coughs> covers the Cap Pathways to 2050, which were just signed last week in Morocco, so I recommend that. So I'd like to very briefly introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Jose Echeverri. is a co-chair of the Sustainable Energy Initiative at New York University. He's a member of the World Council of Renewable Energy, Japan's Renewable Energy Innovation Network, and Scientific Committee of the International Renewable Energy Storage Conference. As you can tell from those affiliations, renewable energy is his thing, and I think we can say, Jose, that you are the, the historical in Canada when it comes to 100% renewable energy, and that's going to be the theme. Uh, that he will speak to us today. So, uh, no further ado, uh, I'll invite Jose to begin. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am West Coast too. Uh, you may notice so with a slight different accent. Um, so, my remarks have to do with uh, uh, what I think needs to happen now in this country uh, of ours. I'm Canadian by choice, uh, not by birth, but I'm a very proud Canadian. And uh, basically what I'll do is uh, follow very religiously what uh, Angela told me to do, which is to keep my remarks to 15, 20 minutes to open up the floor. Um, so you may have noticed that I changed a little bit the title. Um, and the reason why I changed, it, changed the title is because I understand this will be uh, put in the internet uh, and it'll be based on the web. Uh, so I'll be able to direct uh, future people to look at this in the web. Uh, I'm working in parallel on a publication on what I'll be telling you. So um, I would neglect, uh, I, I would be neglectful if I didn't mention who actually uh, helps me pay the mortgage. Uh, I work for York University uh, and I'm the co-chair of the Sustainable Energy Initiative. That's the extent of my commercial uh, uh, parts right now. That's our website in case you didn't know it. Uh, we're based out of uh, the city of Toronto. Um, as Michael said, I'm, I'm part of a global campaign that is uh, pushing for 100% renewable energy. Is it going well? Well, it all depends. Is a, a glass half full or half empty? I'll let you decide that. Uh, all I can tell you is that when we started the campaign, uh, people thought we were crazy. They still think we're crazy, uh, but we're making really big headways. There's entire countries that are going 100% renewable energy, uh, and uh, they are not sometimes very known. Uh, one of them is called Uruguay. Uh, Uruguay just changed government, and they want to keep going 100% renewable energy. If you don't know much about Uruguay, I suggest you take a look. Uh, their former president was as awesome as Nelson Mandela, and he's still alive, so he's still making uh, really good ideas. Um, here you have uh, sort of the roadmap that we use in different countries, different cities uh, to advance the idea of 100% renewable energy. I will not get into it right now unless you want to ask me a question about it. Instead, I want to 
cut to the chase, uh, which is for uh, our country uh, to achieve, or any country, any city, to achieve 100% renewable energy, we must focus on the community. If we do not engage with the community, we're not going to reach even 2%. And even if we reach 10% through some sort of corporate arrangement, uh, there's going to be backlash coming. Where I'm coming from is we work really hard to phase out coal power in uh, Ontario. That's where these ideas of phasing out coal came. Uh, yeah, we phase it out, but now we're dealing with the consequences of not paying attention to this truism. Uh, and there's a lot of backlash in rural areas all over the planet. Uh, by people that should not be backlashing against renewables. They should be saying, instead of NIMBY, they should be saying, pool, please, on our land. Because it gives, if you're a farmer, it gives you another crop called wind or called solar. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and if you want to engage with the community, at least in the area where I work, uh, what makes a lot of sense is to develop projects through an experiential learning perspective. So local people can not only be the owners of renewable energy, but become the actors that make it possible. Case in point, say if you want to develop a wind turbine here, you have one in Grouse Mountain, which I hope to go see more. Currently today is too windy to climb. Uh, but if that's done with the collaboration of a university, a technical college, and it becomes a training facility for local people, then you have the situation that people that are involved in bringing that up, making it happen, can go for the rest of their lives all over the province, the country, and the world installing uh, renewable energy systems. So that's very important, uh, learning by doing. And if you want sort of a different perspective, I call it altruistic pragmatism. Um, and I will come back to this uh, idea of altruistic uh, pragmatism because it can be used for things like software. Uh, and maybe I'll have the chance to tell you that. Um, I also belong to a group that Michael did not mention, but we're a bunch of scholars from coast to coast, unfortunately Vietnam <coughs> to the top coast. Um, and there are about 60 of us that have been working uh, since the Dark Ages. Uh, that is a lost decade uh, that just ended uh, with the election of the current government. Uh, and we were advocating for climate change and bringing together uh, doers with knowers uh, to try to think uh, change things around. Um, so what is the status quo? Well, uh, the current status quo is that we have carbon pricing. Thank you, British Columbia. I came here to say thank you for your carbon tax. Uh, without your carbon tax, those of us in the East would be freezing, uh, to paraphrase some things that used to be said in the past. Um, coal's out. Anybody that is still advocating for coal uh, works for somebody else, not Canadians. Um, Government procurement, it's happening. Uh, governments uh, are beginning to say, heck, we have control of what happens in the marketplace, so let's actually structure markets in a smart way. Uh, and this is happening in places as uh, unique as Alberta, which is great. Um, and the federal government's following suit. Um, and uh, I put a question mark on that one, because I'm not really sure. When I was in Ottawa a few weeks ago, they told me, yeah, yeah, Jose, don't worry about it. We will put a filter on all the stimulus investment. But I'll be there when I see it, to be honest with you. Um, this is the type of work we do. Uh, you cannot see it. Maybe you can see it, but folks from the second row. This is uh, working with a professor from Stanford, uh, Mark Jacobson. We're looking at how, what does it look like? How many solar systems? How many wind turbines? Uh, and how we make it happen with our community focus. Uh, you know this, so again, thank you, Vancouver. Uh, without uh, the work that Michael's been doing on renewable cities, Victoria would not have said, yeah, let's go 100% renewable energy. And certainly, Oxford County, my favorite spot in, uh, uh, I would be saying, east of Vancouver in Canada, uh, that also has decided to go 100% renewable energy. And there you can see yours truly with the mayor. Uh, Michael, you remember the mayor, came to meet your mayor here. Uh, coolest mayors in Canada right now, the mayor of Woodstock and the uh, mayor of Vancouver. And as I mentioned, we're gaining momentum. Uh, this photo was taken not in Marrakech, but in Paris, right after these horrid uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, you were not allowed to do demos. 
but we got permission to do this one, the P-side, the Eiffel Tower, and 100% renewables. And as I mentioned, we got some friends now high up in the scale of things that are pushing for 100% renewable. I think you may know that guy. Uh, and this happened right before uh, Prime Minister Trudeau became uh, the uh, Prime Minister of all of Canada. And uh, so it's not just Paris, it's happening. Um, so uh, what would a Canadian renewable energy program to achieve 100% renewable energy should look like? And I'm talking now beyond the status quo, beyond what's happening already. We call phase out, carbon pricing, etc. So it has to be community focused. I mentioned it has to foster learning by doing. It has to uh, develop capacity at the local level by sharing know-how, castle style. Um, and if castle style means uh, nothing to you, please ask me when I stop talking, uh, what, what do I mean by castle style? Uh, one tip, uh, it's in uh, Deutschland. Um, and it has to be focused not just in electricity. We need to worry about buildings, uh, conditioning them, uh, either heating or cooling, uh, and also transportation. So more specific, what does it look like? Well, we need a new Canadian community incentives program. Uh, we also need to pay attention to R, D, and D. We are really good in this country at the first two, R and D, but we are terrible at the other D. So we fund stuff, people do innovation, but when it comes to diffusion, commercialization, we kind of fall asleep on the switch. We say, good luck to you, the market will take care of it. The Germans, on the other hand, put huge amounts of money into R, D, and D. There are actually percentages of their GDP that they put. Uh, and this is how they become the leaders of renewable energy. And they don't care whether the Chinese uh, or the Koreans or the Mexicans come to compete to Germany because they make the robots that make the solar photovoltaic uh, factories. Uh, they're at that level right now. Um, and uh, we definitely need desperately a new uh, e-transport program. Uh, fast uh, renewable energy rail, uh, it's happening already, ladies and gentlemen. If you go to uh, the juncture between uh, Antwerp and uh, Brussels, there's huge uh, tunnels with photovoltaics where electric trains run below. Uh, this needs to happen. We need to have electric transportation. In a country like ours, it's ludicrous uh, that we're moving around in combustion engines. Um, and uh, we need to revive the fee-based system. Uh, how many of you lift up your hand know what a fee-based means? Okay, so I can see it correlates with age. And he would remember because you were there when we made it happen. Back in 2004, back in the dark age, before the dark ages, uh, you would buy a car and you would pay tax according to pollution. So if you bought a monstrosity, you pay for your choice more tax. And then if you were a little more virtuous person and bought either a low emission vehicle or nowadays an electric vehicle, you got, instead to pay taxes, you got a rebate. So then it's revenue neutral, everybody's happy, um, except the ones that buy monstrosities. But the good thing about those that buy monstrosities is that they tend to have money to do that. Um, we also need a new family farm program uh, because uh, the family farm is being destroyed in this country. Um, and one of the things that we can do is provide those that are still on the land uh, with the tools to be autonomous from the uh, networks that chain society, pipelines, nuclear plants, whatever it may be. Uh, sustainable energy autonomy means to be able to do efficiency, conservation, and renewables at the farm. So you can have, do more with this, uh, and also have new crops, you know, and this needs to happen. Um, and this other one, I call it reforestation. So it's both reforestation, so we need to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, but we also need to use uh, renewable energy uh, forestation. Because in some places where it's extremely cold and the sun doesn't shine all the time, uh, plants are a really nice solar device. Uh, they store sunshine when it's available, and then we can use it for biogasification. Heck, you know about this, because you got UVC. 
<laughs> right? And UBC, you're doing wonderful things on this. Um, we also, uh, this is the last part, we need to re-engage. So again, renewable energy engagement. Uh, we've been the bad uh, people in the international scene for way too many years. Uh, we have become uh, people that uh, draw scorn rather than praise when we're around the world. Um, and I can tell you some stories, please ask me about that. Um, the first thing about that is uh, Monsieur Dion has to remember uh, to join the International Renewable Energy Agency. He kind of forgot, you know, he brought a motion to the uh, parliament back in the dark ages uh, and uh, he, he got turned down uh, for the obvious reasons. But now that he's in charge of global affairs, I keep asking him, hey, so when do we join the International Renewable Energy Agency? Hopefully soon, so maybe you want to send them a handwritten letter. How many of you know about the International Renewable Energy Agency? Okay, that's better. Please tell the other ones that don't know. Um, and you would be uh, forgiven not for knowing about this agency because uh, it got formed and Canada has refused to join since 2009. We also need to open up uh, our country so we can bring people to study here. Heck, we got a golden opportunity now. I mean, think about it for a second. If you got children that are going into university, where would you rather send them? To Chicago or to Vancouver? To New York or to Ottawa? And the list keeps going on, Nova Scotia, et cetera. We keep making a few of those. This is golden for us right now. It's a safe place to come to study, and we need to have a focus, just like the Germans do, but so you don't think I'm a monothematic person, the Icelanders do, do this. So they have a United Nations geothermal program where they bring people from low-income nations that have geothermal potential to study in Reykjavik. And they're really, really smart. In Reykjavik, they have a building that it's the Icelandic Energy Authority, the Icelandic Geological Authority, and the United Nations Geothermal Academy. Why are we not doing this? Well, uh, we need to do this type of things. People should come to UBC to study how you do combined heat and power district energy with biomass. They should come to Toronto to study how we do solar charging of electric vehicles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And not just university and college students. But we need secondments of people that are working in utilities uh, or in uh, race calls or other things like that from all over the world to come to our country uh, to learn the Canadian way. Um, and we also need to globalize Canadian innovation tools. I mentioned to you earlier that this term of uh, altruism, uh, altruistic pragmatism can be translated into uh, tools, and you have one right there. Uh, Red Screen. Red Screen Expert has been recently released. How many of you know, know about Red Screen? Okay, wow. Nick, you, you gotta tell people about this. So this is an amazing tool that our government made, uh, has been developing over a decade, uh, over a decade, and it allows you to basically use NASA data to pinpoint in any little corner of the planet to see what you can do there with renewables, with other energy sources. And we just have now Red Screen Expert uh, done, and actually my shop in the university is a training institute worldwide for this uh, on, in English. If you want to study in French, you go to Paris and Quebec. But this should be free of charge for everybody in the planet. At the moment, we have 400,000 users uh, of Red Screen, and we should have 40 million users. Uh, and the only way you're going to get that done is if the federal government puts more money onto this. Um, well, we also need to uh, restart uh, programs that we used to have before the dark ages, like providing uh, funding for community sustainable energy solutions. We used to do that uh, a long time ago, and those of you that have been climateers for a long time will remember, right? We used to meet in Ottawa to discuss what projects would be good, what projects would be bad, and people would come from Brazil to tell us, uh, please do not finance uh, eucalyptus plantations for carbon sequestration, uh, because they destroy the, uh, the Mato Grosso. Uh, now we need to do this again. The planet is looking at Canada for an example. They, s they see us, uh, our country, and they say, listen, you guys have what we need. 
share it. And we need to start doing that. And uh, in Mexico, for example, you want to develop a solar facility, you'll be lucky if on a commercial basis you get a bank loan at 9% interest. And I'm talking a commercial installation. Imagine a community energy program. Check the money and thank you, man. They'll say, you guys, no. And that's where Canada needs to play a role. Um, anyways, um, please, uh, this is, uh, I told Michael, uh, he may be the one, but if somebody else, please remember to ask me why we need this pan-Canadian pan initiatives that I mentioned to you, hint to you, climate change is not the reason. Uh, and I will tell you uh, if you ask me. Um, I mean, climate is important, but there's another way more interesting reason that people need to be aware of. Um, but for now, allow me to show you how uh, all that I'm talking about can work and why it's a very good idea. But before I do that, I need to look at Angela and do the time check. How am I doing time check? 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay, so then I stop because I'm a man of my word. Um, why do you have, I, have, I always keep my word. So this to be shown if you want to, but I will not go any further than 15 minutes. I keep my word. So any questions? Great, thanks so much. Thank you. I'll moderate here. But if you want to.